And with the salvation story of Jesus in view, uh, there's understandably something that is deeply unsatisfying about the, uh, the salvation story of Esther. Uh, our discomfort is peaked because, well, we have a better gospel story uh, going out in these, these days before that final day. We, we left the story of Esther a couple of weeks ago with that, with that day of destruction sort of looming ever nearer. Uh, and even though God's people now have a, uh, uh, their champion, as it were, raised to rule at the heart of power, their rescue hasn't yet been accomplished. And uh, now as we've been journeying through this story, uh, we've, we've sort of seen or had a bit of a taste of the, uh, the hatred for God and for uh, his people that's bubbling up all across this kingdom. Uh, yes, we've seen the sort of the Haman bubble uh, burst. Uh, and yet as our, our story unfolds this morning, uh, we'll see that his hatred was actually only the tip of the spear. Uh, now, before we dive into the story itself, uh, I wanted to pick up a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is this. As the story unfolds, particularly in the bits that we've not uh, read out yet, um, the overriding tone uh, in the face of all the destruction that plays out uh, is not discomfort. It's delight. Uh, that's because this is a story about being rescued from the jaws of death. Uh, these final chapters, as it were, uh, sort of uncomfortably tease out for us uh, that the joy of rescue that we have in Jesus uh, is tied up with our realization that we've been, well, we've been rescued from the jaws of death. Uh, if you know that story of uh, uh, the woman who gate crashes uh, uh, the Pharisee's house when uh, Jesus is there with them and, and, and sort of... Uh, pours oil, uh, uh, perfume on his feet and, and sort of washes uh, his feet with tears. That's the sort of delight that we see playing out in this story. Uh, but what are we going to do with our discomfort when that sort of bubbles up, uh, when that flows to the surface? Because uh, I suspect that as we journey on, uh, there will be something of us that, that longs that actually this, this story ended in a different way. What do we do with our discomfort? Uh, well, firstly, I'd invite us to see how profoundly Christian that discomfort is. It's a discomfort that's been shaped, whether we realize it or not, uh, by the Jesus story. Uh, we, expect the hit, we expect to hear the story of, a, uh, of the Savior who doesn't deal uh, sort of death and destruction uh, to his enemies, uh, but instead dies uh, uh, sort of their death to give them life. Uh, that's the Jesus story. Uh, so when we hear a story like this one, uh, that, where that doesn't happen, it, it jars, it, it's uncomfortable. I suspect even more uncomfortable now that I've sort of teed up that tone of delight. Uh, now, I don't want us to duck that tension. Uh, we mustn't duck our discomfort, and we uh, also shouldn't uh, be ducking that invitation to delight. Uh, both of them lead us to Jesus. Uh, but at the same time, both of them can be distorted. Uh, now, we rejoin this story uh, at a time when, uh, well, there, there's many across the kingdom, even in the capital, who want to walk in the footsteps of Haman, uh, who want to see God and his, uh, his people. Uh, well, remember the, the words of that edict way back in chapter 3 uh, that went out across the kingdom, uh, back when the, the signet ring was, was on Haman's finger? Uh, chapter 3, verse uh, 13, the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. Uh, and with that day looming ever nearer, um, uh, we see Esther falling at the king's feet in distress. She's weeping. You know, pleading for him to send out another edict that, that overrules the last one, the one that's looming. You know, the, the danger is real and the danger is, is death. 
Uh, how can I bear to see the destruction of my family, she cries. Uh, well, the answer that comes is directed to um, uh, both her and to, to Mordecai, and um, they're invited to write a new edict. Uh, the older one can't be revoked, revoked. The, the sentence of death uh, still stands. And, and yet in this new one, we see a remarkable reversal. Uh, with the ring now on the finger of the champion of God's people, uh, we see a new order that's sort of rolling across the kingdom. Uh, in the same way as before, with uh, sort of all the king's horses and all the king's men going off across the kingdom. Uh, the language of the order, uh, uh, well, bears a striking similarity to the last one. Uh, when human hands hold the pen to, uh, to justice and judgment, uh, it seems like we only sort of are able to work in one language. We've got limited ways of working, a restricted vocabulary. Uh, but there is a difference. Uh, so the first, the first uh, one was a dispatch to decimate, uh, to annihilate all of God's people. Uh, this one is a, well, it's a dispatch to defense. Uh, it granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves. Uh, it's a decree that carries with it both the prospect of, uh, of judgment, but also the prospect of rescue. And when that first edict went out, uh, Xerxes and Haman uh, enjoyed a, a drink as, as Susa was left in dis, well, disarray. Do you remember that? Uh, with this edict going out, though, uh, we see something different. Mordecai sort of steps out, and he's, uh, he's wearing his royal garments and, uh, and crown. That, that temporary transfiguration that we saw uh, a couple of weeks ago is now a permanent fixture. Uh, and it's not into disarray that he steps in Susa. Uh, there's, there's a joyous celebration. Uh, this dispatch doesn't lead to disarray. It, 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 instead, it leads to delight. Uh, verse 17 of chapter 8, or there or thereabouts. Um, uh, in every province and in every city to which the edict of the king came, there was joy and gladness among the Jews, with feasting and celebrating. For the Jews, it was a, a time of happiness and joy, gladness and honor. Uh, they'd been living under the jaws of, well, of death. Uh, and yet now they hear this sort of gospel proclamation in, 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 in one sense that, that holds out to them the hope of life. And it's not surprising that they rejoice. And we see others jumping on board as well because with this day uh, looming ever nearer, uh, there are two competing dispatches, aren't there? They're both going to happen on that one day. Uh, and the people effectively across all the kingdom have nine months to decide, well, who they're with. And we read that many people became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them. What a change from chapter 2, when it was dangerous to admit that you were a follower of the Lord's. Now we have people queuing up to join in. What a reversal. Uh, all over the kingdom of the world, there are, uh, there are people beginning to understand that, that, uh, well, that God's people have a champion uh, who sits in the place of power. Uh, and when they see that, they, they choose their side. But as they choose their side, they also land in crosshairs. Uh, because in those nine months, uh, with this sort of gospel going out, not everyone... Uh, is willing to stand down from slaughter. Uh, and so the, the day comes, the day determined by uh, Dice all those months ago um, uh, to bring about the decimation of God's people. Well, it doesn't fall in the way that the enemy desired. Uh, the hidden hand of God has, has turned the table. Uh, it started in the citadel and now it spreads. Uh, across all the provinces of the kingdom of the world, judgment falls. Uh, not on the innocent, but on those who stepped out uh, of their doors in the morning, uh, armed to destroy the people of God. 
course, that's, that's not how things play out. Uh, chapter 9, verse uh, five, the, uh, 5, the Jews struck down all their enemies with a sword, killing and destroying them, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. In the city of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. Uh, they also killed uh, the, the 10 sons of Haman, uh, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Uh, the number uh, grows as that same story plays out all across the kingdom at uh, 75,000. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? Uh, we likely balk at it. Uh, our, our discomfort longs for an edict which speaks a different language, uh, a different judgment, uh, a, a cross shaped judgment. Uh, yet this is a different time and a different place. Uh, these killings may be rough justice, but they are seeking justice. Uh, this, this is not an age of industrial imprisonment. And, and those killed clearly uh, weren't willing to settle for anything less than dishing out that same sentence. Uh, and they came, out, well, th- they came out in large numbers. Uh, On that first day alone in the citadel of Susa, 500. Uh, And yet there were more because we're shown a sequel in the citadel. Um, uh, When the the, the day's finished, the the king uh, plays back the particulars to uh, to Queen Esther and he asks her, okay, well, what next? Uh, And Esther answers, well, if, if it pleases the king, give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this edict tomorrow uh, also. And let Haman's ten sons be impaled on poles. The, the sequel in Susa is, 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 is perhaps even more uncomfortable than, than the first. And, and another 300 men are put to death. It's uncomfortable, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, But I want to invite us for a moment to to glance beyond our discomfort and register the level of hostility uh, to God and to his people uh, at the heart of the very kingdom of the world. Uh, In the very citadel itself, there are effectively 800 Hamans. Now, Still glancing beyond that discomfort, we're, we're told several times that as all of this going on, uh, is going on, they don't lay their hands on the plunder. Uh, they could have. Can you remember? It was in the edict. It was a, there was, there was a, a line there about plundering. And, and yet they didn't. Why? Uh, they didn't. Uh, because at the heart of this, I, I want to suggest that this isn't a story of, of personal vengeance. I'm sure some of that went on, uh, but, but the overall story that we're uh, invited to witness uh, is, is God's people executing judgment on God's enemies. Uh, and as agents of God's judgment, there was no place for personal gain in the, uh, in the, in the, in the patterns that were set out in the Old Testament. Uh, th- this is a story of, of judgment and of rescue. Uh, It's not one that any of God's people are invited to repeat. Uh, Let's be very clear on that. Uh, But it does point forward to a day uh, in which the final final judgment of God will fall. Uh, Once again and finally. Uh, when, the, when the rescue and victory of, that, that, that Jesus won uh, for us will be finally realized uh, in its fullness. But, but what do we do with our discomfort? I guess we could ask ourselves the question of where does it, where does it drive us? Uh, it might drive us towards sort of, well, trying to scratch out the whole sort of judgment thing. Uh, or ignore it, sort of push it under a carpet. I, I find it interesting, though, that in, in the story of the New Testament, it's, 
It's Jesus uh, who speaks the most about judgment. Uh, he seems to think it's important that we, uh, well, we keep it in the picture. Uh, Jesus is willing for us to be uncomfortable. Uh, so long as it drives us towards, well, towards him uh, to be rescued. And now the harrowing reality of, uh, is that in, this, in the story of the kingdom of the world, uh, the enemies of God are not just the sort of the Hamans uh, of this world, it's, it's the humans of this world. In the sense that we're the ones who uh, have walked away from God. Uh, and yet the longing, of, uh, the longing of the Lord, the longing of Jesus uh, is... Uh, well, it's to not leave us as, as enemies, as those who have walked away. Uh, the longing of Jesus is for rescue. Uh, he doesn't delight in death. And so when we speak about the uh, sort of delight being the tone of this, this story, it's not, centered, it's not a, a delight that is centered around judgment. It's a delight that is centered around the experience of rescue. Uh, which is why, uh, as a new day dawns on the, uh, on the rescued people of God, so does relief. Uh, you know, the dangers of death have been, uh, have been dealt with, and so uh, uh, the rescued people of God, they, they rest and they rejoice. Uh, there are feasts all around the kingdom of the world. Uh, but one feast isn't enough, because, uh, well, a festival has found it. Uh, a festival that remembers the story of God's rescue. Uh, it doesn't relish the death. Uh, it rejoices in the deliverance. Uh, all the king's horses and all the king's uh, men get another trip out across the kingdom. They've had a busy, uh, a busy season. Uh, but they're bringing this time, uh, uh, 9 verse 30, words of, of goodwill and assurance. Uh, and the festival of Purim is, uh, is established, a festival that's to be celebrated throughout the generations. Uh, with anyone who is willing to sort, of, sort of jump on board with the people of God. Uh, in England, on the 5th of November, uh, people have made effigies of their enemies and, uh, and burned them on bonfires. That is not uh, how Purim was supposed to play out. Uh, instead, it's, it, they feast, they, uh, they rejoice, they give gifts to the poor. Uh, instead of overflowing with hatred, God's people are invited to, well, overflow with generosity and love. Uh, that's where rescue leads. Uh, that's where celebrating the, uh, the, 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 the great reversal, the, uh, their rescues from the clutches of death leads. Uh, delight. Uh, now, as we were, uh, sort of approach Easter... Uh, we, we celebrate the greater uh, reversal, the, the, the greater rescue to which, um, well, to which this story of salvation points. Uh, I suspect that the, the discomfort that we feel uh, inside uh, in, in this story of Esther is because we have Easter in view. Uh, you know, we have a, a, a savior who speaks a different language when it comes to uh, well, when it comes to edicts, uh, Jesus, the one who is not just able, but uh, willing to save, uh, not, in the, not by a sword, uh, but by as a lamb, uh, but as a lamb led to the slaughter. Uh, and with the salvation story of Jesus in view, uh, there's understandably something that is deeply unsatisfying about the, uh, the salvation story of Esther. Uh, our discomfort is peaked because, well, we have a better gospel story uh, going out in these, these days before that final day. Uh, we live in a, in a world that is, uh, that is dangerous, uh, in which there is, uh, well, think of, the, think of the persecuted church uh, across the world. Uh, who face death every day uh, for following Jesus. 
Uh, or the, the, the Christian that's, that's hounded in school. Uh, or belittled behind their back in the workplace. Uh, because of Easter, uh, they don't need to go out and defend themselves uh, to receive life. Uh, we have a gospel story that, that holds out to us life. Uh, not through self-defense or uh, whatever self-righteousness we feel we can muster up. Uh, but through the Savior's death uh, on, uh, on, uh, that has already been dealt on the cross. Uh, his life, his peace, uh, his joy, his forgiveness, his comfort uh, is already ours. Uh, we, we have a gospel story that, is, that doesn't need to wait on a, on a greater rescuer. Uh, instead, we can look back to a, a, an, en- an empty tomb and, a, and a, a raised, ruling rescuer. Uh, we have a gospel story that doesn't uh, rest merely on uh, the greatness of one who, uh, chapter 10, verse 3, um, is, is merely second in rank. Uh, to the king, uh, to King Xerxes in the halls of power. Uh, we have one who, uh, well, who in the halls of power rules over it all. Uh, who offers us rescue not just from the jaws of death, uh, but from the dangers of that final day. Uh, Esther uh, holds out encouragement and, and hope uh, for us in a hidden God in a threatening world. Uh, His uh, story of rescue leads out of uh, danger and darkness and into delight. Uh, But we're led into an even deeper delight uh, as Easter dawns.